So we are ready. An official good morning to everybody. Good morning. And we are ready for our Zohar class today. Very exciting, very nice one. And we're going to delve right into it in the Torah portion of Acharei Mos, which is all about the death of the two sons of Aaron. And over there, there is a verse that talks about where God tells Moses to tell Aaron, uh, your brother, that the al yavol bechol es el kodesh that you should uh, not come telling Aaron to <coughs> the holy uh, place, which is at that time, we're talking about the tent of uh, meeting, uh, and that there is particular times and ways that a Kohen should come there uh, in the proper decorum, not drunk, and so on and so forth. So now here in, in the book of Zohar, volume three, page 57b, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai starts the, the talk and says, Rabbi Shimon Posach Wa'amah, Rabbi Shimon opened up and said that there is a verse in the book of Kohelet, Exiliastics, where it says, Kol Hanecholim Holchim El Hayam, all the streams go to the city, the Hayam Eneinu Male, and and this and uh, uh, all the uh, streams go to the sea, and the sea doesn't get filled with water. In other words, look at this amazing thing. Amar Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon said, Tavano Al Bnei Alma, that it's it's a it's a wonder on the people on the world, uh, of the world, everywhere that they are, that the that they don't have eyes to be able to see. What does it mean to see? In other words, to be able to understand things. He just uh, quoted a verse as an introduction to what he wants to say. There's a verse that says all the um, streams are going to the sea and doesn't get filled up. In other words, people should, should be opening their eyes to see the power of God, the amazing things that are going on in this world and understand godliness through them. So he says it's a shame because people are, uh, are not doing that. They are not opening the, their eyes. Also, they don't have the, the understanding in their heart to understand from themselves what's going to be and, and understand everything of godliness that is going on in this world. And they don't even have the will to know, to understand any of this. And they're not giving their heart to, to, to on, this, on this subject matter to understand what is the will of their master? Well, who's their master? That's, uh, that's God. And they are not paying attention to why it is that God has sent them down to this world. So this is the introduction that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is now giving. How, look at this, how they are sleeping and they don't wake up from their sleep. Ad la yesi hahu yema, the chafi alaihu chashecha vekabla. Before, and they're not waking up from this dream, before comes the day that the darkness is going to be covering over them completely. That the, the collateral that was put in their hands, which is their soul, is going to be taken from them. In other words, when he says the day of darkness is going to cover them, he means the day of their passing. So people are not waking up in this world to realize what's going on behind the scenes. There is an announcement that is being made from the heavens every single day. And is telling the Jewish people that you should all return, come back to your source. And even though you may say, well, I don't remember hearing such thing. And uh, your friend may say, oh, I didn't hear such thing either. 
these heavenly voices are the heavenly voices that are heard by the soul of a person, but not necessarily by the physical senses of the person. So the, the effect of it is there. The soul is receiving these messages. And the souls of every person is giving testimony every single and night. Or I said, Ram's calling the whole Avar Machrezes Meres. And the same thing, not only there is a heavenly voice, but also the Torah itself, which has life force, it raises its sound, its voice, and announces and says, Ad Mosai Pesoim Te Ahavu Pesi, which simply translated means, uh, Until when are you people? Uh, who are acting like fools are going to just attach yourself and, and be in love with foolishness. And furthermore, me pesi, so here uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai continues and says, when the Torah says, uh, uh, until how long you people who are foolish are going to love foolishness, what is, it, what is he talking about? Who is he referring to? Who is it that doesn't have enough wisdom here? Yasur Heina, so the Torah is saying that whoever is in such a level where is not able to open up his eyes and is acting foolishly, then come here, remove yourself from the position that you are spiritually, and come here, Chasar Lev, whoever is lacking understanding in his heart so should come and so to say learn Torah if you don't have your own if you don't have enough understanding on your own enough wisdom in your heart to be able to see what's going on so then come it's an expression that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is using here come eat from my bread and and drink from my wine. And this, of course, is all referring to the Torah itself, that these are what Rabbi Shon Bar Yochai says, this is what the Torah is telling us, that come to me. If you don't have the wisdom on your own, then you should dedicate time and effort and your mind and heart to learning Torah. And then you will have the wisdom that you need. The lace man, the yarkin, udne, but unfortunately, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai continues and says, there is nobody that would lend his ear and listen to all of this, the heavenly voices that every day are being announced, and the heavenly voice that is coming from the Torah every day. But this man, the is al libe, and there is no one that is awakening his own heart to, to be able to initiate something so that then as a part of that from the heavens above, they should be able to awaken uh, his heart. So nothing is going. He says, unfortunately, people are not paying attention. Now Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai continues, and this is all from the Zohar, volume three, page uh, 58, and the first side of page 58. And he continues, he says, Ta chaze, come and see. That there will be generations that are going to come. So this is very fascinating. This is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. We talked about two and a half thousand years ago. And he says there will be generations that will come. That the Torah will be forgotten from amongst them. And those that are the wise ones, in other words, the, the rabbinic leaders, the ones that really know the Torah, they're all going to be passing away, that there won't be that many of them left. And there will be nobody that is able to ask proper questions in Torah learning and to also answer those questions. And even someone who's going to ask the questions, nonetheless, the answers won't be found because the sages will be missing, the big sages. And it's a vey to that generation, oi to that generation, 
that is not going to have the scholars necessary, like his own generation, like the generation of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And he continues, And from this point on, there will not be a generation. This is what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is saying in his time about his generation, that from this point on, there will not be another generation like ours that has an understanding in all these things. Until the generation when Mashiach will come, that Melech Mashiach, the King Mashiach, will come. Because then is going to be awakened a new level of understanding in the world. As it says in the, in the verse, that everyone will be able to know me in the generation of Mashiach from their small ones to the big ones. And of course here, not only is it's not just a connotation of age-wise that there will be young and old will be able to understand, but it's also referring to a time when those that are young in understanding and old in understanding, so not level of age by the passport years, but by the level of understanding that when the times of Mashiach arrives, at that generation, all the levels of people will suddenly be able to learn Torah on a whole new level. So, in this section, the first section of the Zohar that we discussed, what is explained also, in addition to the text of the Zohar here, in the books of Hasidic teachings, and in particular, uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe in the year 1951. So that was like the second year that he had taken on the leadership in one of his Hasidic discourses. He actually spoke about this about this part of the Zohar and and he explained that relating to this there is a famous verse in the book of Tehillim that King David says and King David over there says Gal Enai he prays to Hashem Gal Enai open my eyes reveal to my eyes so that I could see the wonders of your Torah now, what's fascinating there, the Rebbe explains, is that King David, of course, was no stranger to learning Torah. Not only he learned Torah day and night, he not only learned just the general Torah that was known to everyone, which we call the revealed aspects of the Torah, like the, the, the laws, the oral laws, and, and the book of um, the, the five books of Moses, and so on and so forth but also the esoteric part of the Torah, the secrets of the Torah, being like the teachings of Hasidus and Kabbalah, was also learned by uh, King David, as it's very apparent from the books, his writings, the book of Tehillim and so on and so forth. So why is it that he's still praying over there, even though he had achieved those levels, he's still praying to God that Gal Enai reveal to my eyes, open up my eyes so that I could see the wonders of your Torah. So it is explained that although he had reached very high levels, however, the level of understanding of the Torah, which is called wonders of Torah, meaning it's a very unusual and deep, very revealing aspects of, of the secrets of the Torah, that true level will only be revealed when Mashiach comes. That's when the entire Jewish people will have a superb understanding of all the secrets of the Torah. However, the Rebbe added that as we approach the days of Lagba Omer, Lagba Omer is the day of the passing of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the 33rd day of the Omer. We have started counting the Omer from the second night of Passover, and we count every single night until we finish counting 49 days, and the 50th day is the receiving of the Torah, Shavuos, right? That's when we have all the cheesecake. So on the 33rd day of Lagba Omer is when we mark, we celebrate the passing of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, which was a very special day and very odd that we celebrate the day of his passing. But the point here that the Lubavitcher Rebbe brings out 
is the fact that Lag Baomer, Lamed Gimel, Lag, is the same letters as the Hebrew word that King David uses as saying Gal Enai, open, reveal to my eyes the wonders of your Torah. And the Rebbe therefore says that although it says in the Zohar that it's going to be in the times of Mashiach, when the true secrets of Torah will be revealed and understood, the process has already begun from the time when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai passed away. Because the day he passed away, he revealed even more secrets of the Torah on a whole new level compared to the rest of his life when he was revealing secrets of the Torah. And of course, <coughs> more recent generations, for the past few hundred years, when the entire Hasidic movement started with the Baal Shem Tov, the teachings of the Holy Baal Shem Tov, and then after that, we have the, the Rebbein, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, starting with the Alter Rebbe, the first one, revealing secrets of the Torah, teaching Hasidus. So we are already at the threshold of the coming of Mashiach, and we are already getting a taste of the understanding that people can have in godliness, in learning Torah when Mashiach comes. So, first of all, it is uh, our uh, good mazel that we are in this generation, a generation that has been given permission to learn the secrets of Torah, unlike uh, previous generations, the, the whole revealing of the Torah, the secrets of the Torah, started only about 300 years ago to the public. Until then, it was a very private thing kept amongst the very, very special, high-level, high-caliber scholars. So we are already tasting some, just the tip of the iceberg, of what it will be like in understanding godliness and Torah when Mashiach comes. So we should take heart into the fact that the process for the coming of Mashiach has already started. Now I want to go to the second part of the Zohar that we're going to study, which is in volume 3, page 59b, in, in the text that is in front of you. Zohar, volume 3, page 59b. And this is a very fascinating, fascinating part of the Zohar. And it goes like this. Tanya Omar Rabbi Yossi, so Rabbi Yose one time said that Zimna Chada Havetzlicha Al Mitra. There was one time when the world needed rain. Okay, everybody, the entire world needed rain. It hadn't rained for a long time. Also Lekame the Rabbi Shimon. So they came the sages, some representative of the sages of that generation, of the generation of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar, came to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai to, to ask him, you know, they, they, they want a blessing, we need rain. There, there's no rain in the world, everyone needs rain. Rabbi Yesev, Rabbi Chizkiyo, Ushar Chavraya, who were there in this group? It was Rabbi Yesi. Rabbi Chizkia and the rest of their holy group uh, of, of the close scholars, close knit scholars that used to study together. So when they came there, uh, so they came and they saw that he had gone to his father in law, who was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's father in law, the Rabbi Pinchas Ben Yoir. That was his name, Rabbi Pinchas, the son of Yair. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai had gone there to his father-in-law together with his son, who was Rab Elazar. Came on the Chamalayim, when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai saw them, saw Rabbi Yese and Rabbi Cheskel and the rest of the group coming, Pasach the Omer. So imagine the scene here. Even before they had a conversation. He sees them coming, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and he starts talking to them. And he says, he brings a verse from the book of Tehillim, from the book of Psalms, and says, Shir hine matay, matay sheves That here is a song of ascent from King David. And over there it says, how beautiful and how good it is when 
they, there is a sitting, a dwelling together of brothers, all sitting together. As you recall, this is a famous song, right? Right, and there's many different variations of different tools of uh, those uh, beautiful words. So he starts with this and he starts expounding a Devar Torah. Again, no conversation has, has happened here between the rabbis that came to visit him. He just saw them and he suddenly starts addressing them and talking to them. So he continues and says, My Shevesachim Gam Yochad. What does it mean when King David says in the book of Psalms that sitting of the brothers together? What, what, is, what is brothers here and sitting together? What is it referring to? On the simple level, of course, the simple meaning is, hey, brothers, me, you, everybody else, the, the entire Jewish people, when we have unity, it's the most beautiful thing. But Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai teaches it on a much deeper level. So he says, Just like you, we have spoken about the, the Ark, the Ark of Covenant, that had two cherubim on it, right? The two cherubim, I think it's called, right? Cherubim in Hebrew. And they would be facing each other. So, and, and by the way, the miraculous thing was that not always did they face each other, the cherubim on top of the Ark of Covenant. He continues and says, that at the time, when, uh, when there was a proper unity, so then they would be facing each other. What does it mean, proper unity? So here is where the words of the Zohar have to be understood properly. Here, the terminology of chad de chad, being one on one, is referring to the level of atzilus. If you remember the world of atzilus that we learned about, the highest spiritual world, and it has 10 different levels in there, right? The 10 different sefirot. So we said that each sefirah has its own unique characteristic. There's the kindness, there is severity, and then there is beauty, there is victory, and so on and so forth. However, when down here in this world, everything is going properly the way it should, the Jewish people are doing what they need to, that causes a certain level of unity in the sefirot above, in those 10 levels, where all these different sefirot, kindness and severity and so on and so forth, are able to mend together and to join hands together to create an interesting balance. We spoke about this in a different lesson, previous lesson when we learned about the holiness of Shabbat, where we learned how this unity happens on its own in the upper sefirot in the world of Atzilut on the day of Shabbat. That's why the day of Shabbat is holy on its own. Even without us doing anything, something special happens in the way the sefirot connect together in the world of Atzilut. So here Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says that when would the cherubim on top of the ark be facing each other when there was a unity of this sefirot in the world above, which would be caused by what? It would be caused by the Jewish people down here in this world. If they do what they need to, that unity would happen and it would mirror itself in the way the cherubim on top of the ark would be facing each other. And that's why it's, it refers to in the verse in the book of Tehillim, book of Psalms, and says, Matov umanaim. How beautiful and how uh, proper, I would say, uh, or another word for beauty. How nice and how beautiful, how good and how beautiful it is that the fact that the brothers sit together. So here, the, the Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai explains, that this, these words of how good and how beautiful are referring to the two levels of kindness and severity, the two sefirot in the world of Atzilut. So when the verse says, Ma manoim gam yochad, how good and how beautiful is saying that when kindness and severity are united together and they are, they're, they're able to be united in that unique way, so that's when 
everything is perfect balance in the world. However, if the sefirot above, as sometimes allegorically referred to, the first group of the sefirot, uh, as being zer anpin, the small face, that's the first six um, emotional sefirot, that is referred to as the masculine level. And then you have Malchot, kingdom, which is the lowest level of Atzilut, where is allegorically referred to as Nukvin, the, the feminine level of, of Atzilut, when there is not a unity between them, when it says the masculine it turns his face away. In other words, those levels of Sefirot are not uniting together says, Oy vey to the entire world when everything gets completely messed up. Kadein Kasiv Mishli, and he continues and says, that's why it says in the book of Mishli, below Mishpat, below Mishpat Badai, that at that time then there is no proper judgment, a judgment that has uh, in it Rachmanus. You know what Rachmanus is? When you have compassion, in when you're trying to figure something out, to judge something, that there should be a certain level of compassion. And Rabbi Shon Bar Yochai says, in that case, there is no compassion. The compassion is missing. And it says in Tehillim, that righteousness and judgment is your seat. Because one doesn't go without the other. And when it comes out to be in such a level, when there is no compassion involved, because there is no unity of the levels of kindness and severity to create a proper mix in the heavens above, then the entire world suffers. It trickles down to this world. Why? Because then, the characteristic of severity, of harsh judgment, is what is, is, is judging the entire world. And, and then that's it. Without compassion, who could withstand severity of, of, of such a level of judgment? So, so this is all part of the teaching that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai gave a, a lecture that he gave to all these sages that came by. And this is even without any of them opening up their mouth. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai now continues speaking to all these sages and says, that now that I see you guys have come here, because the, the masculine hasn't united with the feminine, referring to the heavenly ten sefirot. In other words, he says, because I see that in the heavens above, the, all the, the ten sefirot are not achieving the proper unity as it should. And of course, that has a reason because of us down here. So... Omar So at that point, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai finally is addressing them with something that they could answer to. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, if that's what you came for, because there is an imbalance in the heavens above and the proper unity is not there for all the sefirot, and therefore there is a lack of compassion in the way the world is being judged, and there's a harsh judgment on the world. If that's what you came for, Tivu, you could go back now. The Hayyoyma is this Hadar Kolo Lemishe Ampin the Ampin. Because today I have looked and I have seen in the realm of Atzilus at the Sefirot, and I see that today things will be changing and there will be a unity of the Sefirot. And there will be a new release of compassion because of it upon the world. So your problems, your, your question that you came for will be answered. You know, rain will be fine. However, if the reason why you guys are here is you just came to sit down and learn Torah, 
then not a problem. Shiru Gabai, stay with me. Stay with me and we will learn Torah. So Amrule, so the, the all the rabbinic authorities that had come to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai told him, Le The truth is we came for both of them. We came for the problem that you explained, as far as the, the judgment that is on the world because there is no rain. And we also came to learn Torah. So in that case, they told Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, please allow one of us to go back to inform all the other sages about this news, that everything will be okay. And we will sit down and stay with our master, and uh, we will learn Torah. So, so beautiful story. Which, by the way, it keeps on going on. As a matter of fact, after that, uh, they, they send somebody back to their friends to inform them. And the rest sit down to learn with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And just to, to, to review also with you a bit of the next lesson that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai gave them, uh, and it's recorded in the Zohar, is Pasach Omar. He opened up and he spoke about the Song of Songs, right? The book of Shir Hashirim. And over there, there is a verse that says, Shechayra Ani Venova Benos Yerushalayim. I am black and beautiful, the daughters of Jerusalem. It's a famous verse, which is kind of, uh, has many meanings, many layered meanings. You know, what does it mean I'm black and I'm beautiful? Um, so here, Rabbi Shun Bar Yechai explains, Amra Kinesis Yisrael Kameh Kutcha Birichu, that the level of Knesset Israel, the gathering of the Jewish people, which is a level referred to, uh, to the level of Malchus, the lowest level of the world of Atzilus, turns around and tells the higher Sefirot, which is referred to as Kutsha Brichu, that's the six emotional attributes in the world of Atzilus. So the level of Malchus kingdom, the lowest level says, Shechora Ani Begalusa, that I am blackened because we are in exile. The whole world is in exile. The Jewish people are in exile. The temple is no longer there. Everything is, is, is very dark. The Nava Ani, however, I'm still beautiful. Why? The Pikude Oraisa, because there is still the mitzvahs and the commandments of the Torah. The Afal Gav the Yisrael the Galusa, because even though the Jewish people are in exile all over the world and they're no longer on the same level as they used to be, the same spiritual level, and their eyes don't see what they used to, and they can't even fully understand what they used to as far as the Torah, its commandments, and the secrets of the Torah. Nonetheless, Lo Shavkeloin, the Jewish people have not abandoned learning Torah. And it goes on to say that, in other words, because there is still some level of Torah learning that is happening in the world through the Jewish people, that I'm not completely cut off. This level of spirituality, kingdom of Atzilus, tells the higher levels. So therefore, there is still some level of unity that could happen between us levels, even if it's not the same level of unity as it used to happen in the times of the temple, in the olden times when spirituality was an extremely high level. But nonetheless, not all the roads have become closed. The Jewish people are still opening, keeping the channel open of unity with high levels of spirituality through their learning Torah. So this is the, the part of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the Zohar that uh, we reviewed today. Now, this was a story about this was a story about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and rain coming down to the world. Because, in fact, by the way, as an aftermath of this story, uh, there was rain and everything was perfect, exactly the way the world needed the rain to be. There is another famous story in the Talmud. And for that, I want you to open up the second file, the one that says Choni Tanis. 
Okay, so there's a second document that I sent you, which is an excerpt from the Talmud. Okay, this uh, volume of the Talmud is called Tainis or Tanit, which uh, deals with matters of fasting. Well, this starts from there and then this segues to other topics as well. So amongst the stories that is brought down in that volume of the Talmud, there is a very, very fascinating one about uh, a scholar, a sage named Choni Hameagel. Choni Hameagel, someone famous who was able to bring about rain for the Jewish people. What was the story there? So let's look inside that piece of the Talmud. And I will absolutely do so as soon as I have mine open. Okay, I got it. So let's go through the text here. Uh, you have the Hebrew and the English? Yes? I didn't get anything. Did you yeah. send it in the chat? I will do so again, just in case. Ah, yes, now I have it, thank you. Okay, so pleasure. Go ahead and open it up. So here is a story from the Talmud about rain, and we're going to see a fascinating contrast between this story and the story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai that we just learned in the Zohar. There was a story once that they sent a, uh, a group to a, a group of representatives to Choni Hamagel. Choni Hamagel, his name was Choni, was the name of the sage, and later he became famous because of this story, and they added the name Meagel to him, the, the one that draws circles. So Tana Rabbanon, the, the sages taught us, uh, there was one time when most of the month of Adar, which is the season for rain, had passed already, and, and there was no rain. So they sent a contingency to Choni, the sage, Hamagel, and he spell over Yard Geshamim. He prayed for them. And rains came down. His parallel, Velo Yard Geshamim. So they went to him. And they wanted him to, to pray. So he, he decided to pray. The way uh, he, it says that in Habakkuk, the book of prophets, uh, Habakkuk, it says, al that he, he, he wanted to do the same thing, uh, in the same fashion that he would basically imprison himself. This Choni decided, I'm going to stay in one place and I'm not going to move until it rains. So Omar Lefanov, so he went ahead and drew this circle, okay? And he started praying that the master of the universe, your children have not turned to me, because I'm like someone who has been raised in your house. This is all allegorically speaking. I swear in your great name, I am not moving from this spot, from the circle that he had drawn. Right, so this is a fascinating tale. He he drew a circle, and if I may show on this picture, here, you see the circle. Okay, so so he draws a circle, and and he says, "That's it. I'm not moving from this spot until you have pity on your children." So his chidu geshomim menatin. So at that point, the rain started to come, but trickling, like dripping down. So his students said to him, Rabbi, you know, we've seen that you know, what you're cap capable of doing. Um, however, 
this is not enough. What is this? Trickling rain. I mean, thank you, but this is not going to do the job. Basically, we are going to die if, if this is the type of rain that comes. Um, it looks like uh, just there's enough here to cleanse you from your oath. You know, God does, still doesn't want to give rain to the world. But because you're so special and you made a promise that you're not going to move from that, that spot, God is just satisfying you so that you're absolved of your uh, swearing. And that's it. Now the whole thing is done. So then he turned around again to God, Holy Emmanuel, said, Lo He says, God Almighty, I, this is not what I asked for. So he said, listen, God, I need rain that is going to fill the cisterns and all the ditches and the caves and everything else so that, you know, there is proper water. So this time, suddenly the rain came not drop by drop, but furiously. It was huge drops until... Uh, every drop was as big as the opening of a barrel. And uh, the sages estimated that no drop was less than a lug, which is a big quantity of water. So again, his students turned to him, to Honi Magal, and they said, Rabbi, we've seen that you could call on God to perform miracles uh, so that we don't die. But now it appears, it comes out that now we're going to die from the abundance of the rain. The, the, the rain is going to destroy the world. This is, not, this is not rains of blessing. So then again, Choni Magal turned around and said, Lo kachshalti, this is God Almighty. I didn't ask for this. So, but rather, you know, I need rain of, of benevolence, of blessing and generosity. So right away, Yardu Kisiknon, the, the rain came properly to the proper measure, proper amount in a standard manner until all the people that, uh, until all the people needed to go to higher ground. In other words, there was a lot of water coming up. Uh, they went to the Temple Mount because of the rain, and they said to him, Rabbi, just as you prayed that rain should fall, so too now you should pray that they stop. So he told them, this is what I have received that from, from my teachers I learned, that a person doesn't pray for uh, excess of good to stop. So then, as an, as an aftermath of this story, So Rabbi Shimon ben Shetach uh, relayed to Choni Amagel, sent him a message, and he said, you know, if you were not Choni Amagel, then I would have decreed for you to be cast away that this, you should be ostracized. Why? Because if these were the years like the, the period of Elijah the prophet, when the keys of rain were entrusted in Elijah's hands, and he would have sworn that he would not move until rain comes, then wouldn't the name of Hashem have been desecrated by your oath? In other words, you took a chance. Elijah the prophet did have the key of rain in his hand. So if he made a, a promise, he swore that God, I'm not going to, for example, move, then that wouldn't have been a, a, a swearing in vain. But you, <laughs> you took a chance here. Your swearing of God's name could have been in vain. However, Rabbi Shimon ben Shetach told Choni Amagel, what can I do to you? Because you nag God and he does your bidding, whatever it is. Like a son who nags his father and his father does his bidding. And then the, the son tells to the father, father, take me uh, to bathe, to be bathed in hot water. Wash me with cold water. Give me nuts, almonds, peaches, pomegranates. And his father gives him everything. So it's about you that it says in the book of Proverbs that your father and mother will be glad and she who bore you will rejoice. So Rabbi Shon Ben said, hey, listen, what can I tell you? 
I would have told you you're wrong for making such a promise that you're not going to move from this circle, but hey, it is you and God loves you. So therefore, you did well. So thank you for everything. So that's the Talmud that talks about the story of Honi Amagel. And there is a continuation of the story of his life story is really fascinating and his level of spirituality. Uh, if you would read the rest of the, the story there, um, <coughs> you will read that he actually ended up going to sleep for 70 years. And he woke up two generations later in the generation of his grandson. And eventually he prayed for his own demise because he just didn't want to be in that position anymore. So it's a fascinating story in the Talmud. But what I want to discuss now is what is brought down in Hasidic teachings on this part of the Zohar uh, that we learned about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in comparison with the Talmud that we just learned from Honi Hamagel. Where what we see is that Choni Amagel used the formula of prayer to ask for what was needed for the world, and he got it. And then you have Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, where he didn't pray for rain, but rather he learned Torah and he taught Torah, and that suddenly changed everything, and rain came. And the, the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe teaches that being that the Torah tells us about these two stories, the Zohar and the Talmud, that means these two are both relevant to us. And these are two different ways of asking God for something that we need. There is the way of prayer, and then there is the way of learning Torah. The way of prayer is, of course, when a person has a need and feels that this need needs to be uh, taken care of or has something, a challenge that has come up and it's bothering him or her and prays to God for a good solution for this challenge to be gone or, or it should be eradicated. Very much like we, we are at the midst of these days with, uh, with the coronavirus that has plagued the world. Then there is the second way, just like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, where he learned Torah as soon as he saw the sages coming. He already had, with his divine spirit, knew what the problem is. He says a Torah, a lesson in Torah, teaches it, discusses something deep in the Torah, and suddenly everything changes in the heavens of God, and there is rain. And not only that, the rain was right away exactly the type of rain that was needed. Unlike the story of Honi Hamagel, where he had to pray over and over until it was adjusted to the proper amount of rain that the world needed. So here's a beautiful lesson that while they're both uh, good paths of connecting to spirituality, to godliness, and to changing things in our life in this world for the entire world, the Rebbe explains that there is one way, which is when a person is bothered and possibly saddened by the challenges that he or she has and, and is therefore thinking about it and thinking deeper into all the problems and possibly it could even aggravate the person. And from that kvetch, from that tightness of situation that the person feels, from the lack of breath that the person feels and, and is choking under all these trials and tribulations, he or she screams out to God during prayer, please help, send me the blessings, change things in this world, let it be that everything is taken care of. However, there is another way, in, in addition to prayer, not to say not to pray, but in addition to prayer, there is another path, which rather than a person putting himself or herself more into thinking about the troubles of life, allowing it to have an effect on him mentally or, or uh, emotionally and surely spiritually. And rather than allowing the person to be always with happiness and joy, which is the Jewish way, but rather it brings thinking about all the problems, brings perhaps worries 
anxiety and depression to a person. And then from that frame of mind and emotions, a person is going to pray to God. The Rebbe says the higher level is to learn Torah. Because learning Torah, you're tapping into another whole channel where with simcha, with happiness and joy, you're able to accomplish the same thing that prayer was going to accomplish from being brokenhearted. However, the Torah, being that it comes from the level of only goodness, right? The world went into exile because of the tree of knowledge, which is good and bad, representing spirituality and impurity that became mixed into the world. The Torah itself is all good. It has no level of impurity. It is the wisdom of God. It's the absolute pristine level of spirituality that could manifest itself in this world. So therefore, when somebody is busy learning Torah, it, it could be done in a much speedier way to accomplish what you want because you don't even need to spend time separating the impurity from purity. It's all godliness in a revealed way in this world. And as we see that Honi Hamagel, again, had to pray and pray until it got adjusted to the right amount of rain. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, when learning Torah right away, the answer was rain that was exactly the way it needed to be for the world. And why is learning Torah so powerful? Because as we learned before, that the true depth of Torah and, and revelation of godliness will be in the times of Mashiach, where every soul, every neshama, every person, young and old, will be able to understand godliness on his or her own. It will be open to all. All the rabbis will be completely out of business. You will all be able to teach all these classes. That's how revealed Torah and godliness will be. However, a taste of that world to come, of that era, already exists now through learning Torah. That's a channel that is open to us that gives us a taste of that level of spirituality. So therefore, out of these two paths of praying and learning Torah, again, prayer is important. And Rahamana Libabait Hakodesh Baruch, God wants a, a person's heart to be connected to him, and that's done through prayer. And if you're going to pray, it might as well not be just words that are being said, but your mind and soul is put into it. So therefore, we do put our emotion, we invest in it. And yes, if there is a challenge in life, God forbid there is a sickness or lack of money, or somebody needs children or family, whatever. It should all be in there. Emotionally, it should be invested in the prayer. But let's not forget the advantage of learning Torah, that by learning Torah, you're tapping into something that is able to accomplish as a shortcut all the way to the desired um, result that you want. And it could be done with simcha v'tuv levav, with happiness and joy of the heart. That's something very unique. And that is the, the, the main nekuda, the main point that I wanted to bring out today from these two sections of the Zohar in our Torah portion to, to understand how we could apply them to our daily life, which is the forte of Hasidic teachings. That's what Hasidic uh, learning is all about. It takes what is esoteric and perhaps abstract in teachings of Kabbalah and is able to explain how it applies to every level of our life and how we could bring it down to our own soul and apply it in our day-to-day -day life. So that is the lesson for today. And now if you have any questions, it will be my pleasure to answer. Yes, Beth. Unmute yourself. So you said before that we now have permission 
to, to study the Zohar this way that we didn't used to? Who's we and who gave permission? So the study of Zohar, of course, was, you know, the book of Zohar is approximately two and a half thousand years old. So right. the knowledge has always been around. However, the, the privilege to be introduced to it, for it to be known and explained is, is a new privilege, so to say, until recent generations, until about 300 years ago. It used to be just the domain of the very elite in, in uh, scholarship and in spirituality, people that were of a whole different caliber. It would be taught to by a teacher, by a master, Kabbalistic master, to a very select uh, group of students. It was during the times of the Baal Shem Tov, and the Baal Shem Tov was the catalyst for the one to really introduce uh, this to the public and saying how it is now time for the entire Jewish people to be learning because this is the only thing that is going to help them survive and rejuvenate because the generations have fallen down generation after generation from the times of the temple when the exile has started has been nothing but exiles and pogroms and destruction and war and so spiritually the jewish people had fallen to a very low level they still didn't abandon torah and mitzvahs they were still learning but spiritually to be able to have that warmth that enthusiasm to carry them forward was being lost all over the world so the baal shem tov uh, is the one that said from this point on we have to start teaching these secrets of the torah to the public so that they could feel the warmth again and be able to flourish as far as Judaism is concerned. And of course, then as an aftermath of that, his student, the Magid, was the one that took over. And after that, it was the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, Rabbi Shneir Zalman of the Adi, the author of Tanya and the Code of Jewish Law, and many other Hasidic writings. And then after that, you had all the Rebbe's uh, continuing with that. And by the way, Chabad isn't the only uh, Hasidic group that learns and teaches Hasidic teachings. It is, uh, there's many other Hasidim, as you know, all over the world, Hasidic communities that also learn um, uh, Hasidic teachings and the teachings of the Zohar and Kabbalah. Chabad is known for two reasons, of course, better than the rest. A, Chabad has been active all over the world and has centers everywhere, and also by sheer volume of, um, of writings, uh, the Chabad Rebbe's have written an ocean of, of Hasidic writings, uh, hundreds and thousands of volumes uh, on, on every topic, every verse, every section of the Torah. So yeah, it's, a, it's an ocean of knowledge that Chabad Hasidic teachings have made available. Okay, thank you. Pleasure. Any other questions? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, I hear a voice. Beth. Uh, no, it's... Uh, who is that, Becca? It's Bucky. Bucky, hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, so, for, beginning, for beginners to study Torah, what, what do you um, advise is the best is the best way and where to start and what and what and what material and what is needed right what tools so what what is the beginners um best way to learn torah so i would tell you uh let's uh, let's talk about our appetite and our stomach what is the best food to eat when you come when you sit down to eat so i Great. would tell you Hello. that the best food to eat is a, a variety of foods. When there is a beautiful plate set up, if you go to any fancy restaurant, you will see that has a little nice piece of chicken, perhaps a little bit of meat, if you want separately on a separate dish fish, not this kind of salad, that kind of salad, and so on and so forth. And you know, it's appetizing, it's beautiful, and each one tastes very unique, and together it makes a wonderful, amazing meal and experience. So first of all, 
when it comes to learning Torah, I would say a potpourri of Torah is very good. Yeah, some from the Torah portion, the five books of Moses study, some code of Jewish law, some Hasidic teachings to learn the esoteric parts of the Torah, and so on and so forth. And then lives, and maybe Medrash says, having said that, you may go to a fancy uh, restaurant and they're ready to bring you a variety of salads, for example, and you say, no, I just want Israeli salad. They go, oh, but we have some special. We have this kind of salad, that kind of salad. And you go, yeah, okay, I'll have the chicken, but as far as salad, I, I just want Israeli salad. So what am I saying here? It's good to have a mix of every part of the Torah in your learning regimen. However, if there is a particular part of Torah that speaks to you, that pulls on your heart, and you're really getting drawn to it, then go ahead. That's a sign that your soul yearns for that particular part of the Torah. So if it is in the mix, again, there should be a mix of everything, but out of your time that you're allocating learning, you feel like you want to learn Hasidic and Kabbalistic teachings more, that's fine. It's what your soul is yearning, that's what it's asking for. If it's you want to learn the verses of the Torah portion with the commentaries and with some medrash on it, beautiful, go for it. You have become more now astute and fascinated with the world of Jewish law, the code of Jewish law, and you want to dig deep into it and cover more of it, then go for it. It's like whatever food it is that you like, it's because your body is asking for it the same way your soul is asking for a particular type of learning Torah. But at all times, keep a mix together. A little bit of Torah, five books of Moses, a little bit of Code of Jewish Law, some Hasidic teachings, and then Patpuri of, of the salads, of everything else that comes around. Thank you, Rebbe. So, but, so there's no order or beginning, beginners, there's no order or prerequisite to learn something before something else? Um, well, you know, sometimes certain parts of Torah need a background in order to be able to understand them better. But, uh, but that shouldn't stop you because, hey, listen, if I was to say, I'm going to learn the five books of Moses completely, perfectly good before I, go, I move on to anything else, I, I would still be stuck there, right? It's uh, unfortunately in our generations it's hardly possible to become a master of one level of Torah uh, before moving on to the next. In the older generations, 2,000 years ago, that was a possibility. You know, first they will learn the, the, the five books of Moses completely. They will know it by heart, word by word, with all the commentaries, before they will move on to everything else. In our generations, we got to keep a mix of everything in there because we need the knowledge to know how to live day to day as a, a Jewish life. So we need some code of Jewish law. We need the background of the Torah portion. We need, we need energy to keep us going. So we need the Hasidic and Kabbalistic teachings to keep us spiritually alive and warm towards godliness and spirituality. Otherwise, it's so easy to become cold towards our own roots. You know, so some people may know they're Jewish. They, yeah, they believe in Torah, but they don't feel a fire, a passion for living like a Jew. What fuels that fire and passion is the learning of the Torah, and in particular, learning Hasidic teachings and Kabbalistic teachings is what flames that fire and keeps it going. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. Any other questions? When are we going to see each other again <laughs> in person? Well, in person, God knows. Uh, and as soon as he tells me, I will share that with you. Um, other than that, as you know, this week we have made a lineup of classes, a class every single day. So God willing, on uh, so Sundays is the Zohar class. Monday night will be the Torah class with Rabbi Mendy. And then Tuesday and Wednesday, we have Judaism at home on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, we have Ethics um, of the Fathers which is, again, fascinating uh, Mishnah to learn and to apply lessons in life. And then on Thursday, we'll be back on schedule for the book of Tanya. So uh, for now, virtually, we'll have to see each other and be satisfied with it until things change. Thank yes, you, sir. Bye.
Thank you, Rabbi, for the um, email with those five classes. Just it was so organized and laid out. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. Great. Pleasure. Amazing. All right. Take Amazing. care, everybody. Thank Good you week. so Take much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.